so much for joining us for today's um, Armor Seminar. My name is Jingmei O'Connor. I'm the Associate Curator of Fossil Reptiles, and I'm on the Armor Seminar Committee. So if you have any suggestions for future speakers, please reach out to me. Before we get started, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement statement. The Field Museum acknowledges that the Field Museum resides on the ancestral homelands of the three of the three fire confederacy, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I am going to announce today's speaker, uh, postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Jean Milot. He is currently uh, working in the Department of Anthropology here at the Field Museum, where he specializes in isotopic geochemistry and mass spectrometry. After obtaining two master's degrees in geology and archaeometry, respectively, he completed a PhD at the University of Toulouse, followed by a three-year postdoctoral fellowship at the École Normale Superior, oh goodness, Superior in Lyon, France. Sorry for doing that to your native tongue. Sorry. <laughs> His research interests reside in the development of geochemical tracers to explore the origin of archaeological materials such as metallic artifacts, and more broadly, in the use of earth science analytical techniques to solve archaeological and historical questions. And uh, I was lucky enough to meet Jean on his very first day of his postdoc uh, when he was him, uh, himself and Laura were helping me with the XRF. And since then, we've become very good friends. So that is why I'm very, very excited to put our hands together to welcome this week's speaker. Okay, thank you, Jimmy, for this uh, introduction. So um, uh, thank you all of you for being here today. And I'm really honored to uh, present my research uh, today about the geochemical approach uh, to explore the circulation of uh, ancient ar archaeological metals. So uh, I will begin this presentation with a beautiful picture of the copper mine of Escondida in Chile which I think illustrates the importance of metals in the modern society. Because uh, thanks to the different properties in terms of conductivity or heat resistance and the physical uh, 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 characteristics of the metals, they are now widely used in many aspects of, uh, of our lives. So for example, for energy, transportation, technology, and even medicine, and I'm glad this is not my leg. <laughs> uh, so if there are a strategical res resource now, they were also very important in the past, and the discovery of different types of metals brought uh, major evolutions in the human society. That's why we have defined some uh, of the, the main archaeological periods with the metals which have been used at that moment. So for example, the Copper Age at the end of the Stone Age, and of course the Bronze Age and later the Iron Age. So all these metals brought different evolution, as I said, uh, in the society and in our metallurgy, we make a clear difference between ferrous metals and non-ferrous metals because they brought different changes. So iron and steel have been more used to produce uh, agriculture agricultural tools and also specific tools for craft working and war so uh, and weapons uh, for uh, more efficient weapons uh, for war um, so studying these metals is more related to the question of a better uh, ag uh, agricultural production also uh, the crafting of different objects and of course the uh, military aspect of the ancient societies and among the non ferrous metals uh, the, the gold and silver, uh, which are precious metals, have been widely used to produce money, to mint coins, and also uh, to uh, for, for the production of different uh, uh, prestigious objects. So studying these metals is more related to uh, the question of economy of the old societies and also the trade networks between the civilization and the regalian powers of the rulers uh, in the in the past societies. So when we're talking about tracing metals, in fact, we uh, try to identify the source of uh, the ancient metals and restitute their circulation in the between the, the population, which will provide uh, crucial information on the so socio-economic patterns of the past societies. So 
um, in addition to a, 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 a purely historical and archaeological uh, perspective, we can use now different techniques which have been first developed for earth science to trace ancient metals. So during my work, I was uh, working uh, specifically with different uh, techniques of uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, for example, laser ablation mass spectrometry, spectrometry that I used to analyze the elemental composition of uh, different archaeological materials, and also the mass spectrometry with uh, multi-collection, which allow for the analysis of the isotopic uh, composition of the materials. So I'm giving here maybe the well-known, uh, the most well-known example of uh, isotopic tracer for archaeometry, which are the lead isotopes. So the lead, the lead isotopes are four, uh, they have different mass, and this, the, proto, the proportion of the, those mass will change depending on uh, different geological process. So we can use these techniques, these techniques to analyze the composition of ores, slags, and metals. To, to try to identify some tracers, tracers which will be preserved all along the metallurgical process of uh, metal production. And depending on the type of metals we're talking about, ferrous or non-ferrous, the, um, the, the metallurgical process are quite different. And so the tracing strategies will, will be different too. So here is uh, the process for the production of iron in ancient times. So first, the iron was, uh, the, the, the ore was extracted, concentrated, then it was reduced in a glomerate furnace to, uh, to segregate the slag, which is the silicate waste of the metallurgy, and produce an iron bloom, which was then purified to obtain uh, different bars or ingots, which were, which were then transformed into objects. So the important, sorry, the important point here is that the reduction process uh, the, the temperature of the resistance process is, be, is, be, uh, is uh, below the fusion point of iron. That's why it's very difficult to uh, separate the slag from the, the iron, which will stay in a pasty state. And for this reason, even after the purification step, we can have some inclusion, slag inclusion, into the metal and even into uh, the objects. So the main, uh, so far, the main technique to study the provenance of iron was to use, uh, was to analyze the composition of the slag inclusion, uh, uh, to analyze the elemental composition of those slag inclusion. So I give here an example by Dillman uh, in 2017 of a section of uh, an iron object where you can see the heterogeneity of the metal depending on the carbon content and also all the black spots here, which correspond to slag inclusions. So when we analyze the composition of the slag inclusion, like in this uh, example by Lerike in 2015, <coughs> we can define some couples of elements which will behave in the same way, uh, in the same way all along the metallurgical process, and whose ratio will stay constant uh, all along this, uh, the, 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 the metal production. So this ratio will be aligned, I mean, the, the slag inclusion analysis will be aligned uh, on different lines like that, which correspond to different provenance. So we can use uh, simple uh, plots like that, but we can also uh, use different statistical tools uh, on large data sets of slag, in, uh, slag inclusion uh, to help uh, distinguishing different sources among the, among the samples. But the main problem of this technique is that we have to find some slag inclusion. So we have to cut the objects, which of course is to be a big problem for very rare objects uh, in museum collections. That's why during my PhD, I, uh, I, um, I developed the use of iron isotopes as a new tracer to trace ancient iron. So there are four isotopes of iron in nature. You have here the abundance of these uh, isotopes. Uh, the, isotopic, the iron isotopic composition is expressed by a delta index, which corresponds to the ratio of the sample uh, compared with that of a, an, interna an international standard. We express this delta index in per mil. So if the index is positive, it means that the composition, is, the composition is enriched in heavier iron isotopes. If it's negative, uh, the composition is enriched in light iron isotopes. 
So that's typically the kind of diagrams I use to express the composition of the samples. And you will see a lot of uh, diagrams like this one during this presentation. And I also always compare, always compare my, the composition of my samples with that of the mean continental crust, which have been estimated to 0.1 per mil. So this is for iron metallurgy and iron tracing. So um, the metallurgy of uh, non ferrous metal, and here I'm giving the example of lead silver metallurgy is quite different because it involves two main steps. So the first step is quite similar to that of iron with a reduction process of the, of the ore with different uh, potential additives. And uh, this time the fusion point of, uh, of lead and silver is below the temperature of the reduction process. So it allows to uh, well separate the slag from uh, the metal, which can be molded into ingots. And these ingots, which contain the lead, but also the, the silver, uh, will then be processed into uh, a, a cupellation step, which consists in uh, uh, melting the, the, the metal in an open atmosphere, in a crucible. Uh, so the the, the lead will be removed uh, because of its preferential oxidation. And at the end, we'll just obtain the pure, the pure silver that we can mold again in different uh, ingots. So despite uh, the, the, the purification of the, of the silver, it still contains few amounts of lead, which, have, which are the main, um, the main technique to trace ancient silver. So I'm giving here an example by uh, Eschel in 2019, who compared the composition of different silver objects with that of different sources in Sardinia, in Spain, uh, Anatolia, and in Greece. So we can express the lead isotope composition with different ratio. Here it's 207, 204, 206, 204, and here it's uh, 208, 204, 206, 204. So this different ratio will uh, help us to make the distinction uh, between the sources. But uh, a major uh, problem uh, of this uh, tracing technique, which is also a problem for almost every tracer, is that we can have uh, overlapping compositions between distinct sources. That's why during my first postdoc at the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon, um, I, uh, I developed the use of uh, silver isotopes uh, to complement the uh, lead isotope technique. So, we express the, so, so the, the, the silver isotopic composition is expressed almost uh, like the iron isotope composition with the difference that it's the epsilon index, which is in per 10 mil this time. So here is an example of a diagram with the composition, the silver isotope composition of different coins that I worked uh, on during my uh, postdoc at the, uh, in the ENS of Europe. So in a more technical aspect, uh, the trend of, um, of uh, uh, metal uh, tracing is now to try to minimize the damage on the, uh, on the archaeological objects. So of course, this, the analysis of slag inclusion is a big problem for us, even if it's very efficient. We need to find other uh, methods to trace uh, iron. So this is an example of uh, a sample I took on this uh, gallic bar during my PhD. And the main advantage of iron isotopes is that we, and uh, every isotopic uh, uh, technique to trace metal is that we only need a few milligrams and even a few micrograms to uh, do uh, the isotopic analysis. So during my postdoc in Lyon, I tried to develop different techniques to uh, collect some material in, in silver coins, but um, this, the method we tried were not really successful. And finally, the best way to assess the composition of the coins was to drill them. So we tried to reduce the diameter of the drilling. And here is typically the drills we made uh, with a diameter of uh, 500 micrometers. And here at the Peel Museum, uh, my, my main task was to optimize a new uh, sampling technique, which is the portable laser ablation technique. So the main advantage of this technique is that uh, we can transport the laser device to the collection instead of bringing the objects to, uh, to, the, to the laser device. 
Um, so typically, um, the ablation occurs directly in the air, so the, 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 the object doesn't have to fit into the ablation cell of the classical laser ablation um, systems. And um, this, the, the collected material is, uh, is pumped in, onto a filter, and this filter mm, then uh, will be uh, uh, leached in, in, in thin beakers into uh, concentrate acid. Uh, so all the samples will be uh, treated like that. Uh, uh, also the orange slag samples which are crushed and we uh, a second step consists in the purification of the of the element we'd like to analyze. So we do it on different ion exchange resins. So typically this uh, this resin will allow to catch a specific element in a specific uh, acid concentration. We will rinse all the, the elements which will not be catched on the resin, and when we change the concentration of the acid, the resin will release the elements we want to analyze. So that's the way we purify our samples. And once purified, we analyze their isotopic composition using a mass, uh, a multi collector mass spectrometer. This is the one I was using in, uh, in Lyon. So after this uh, quite long introduction, I would like to uh, show you the first example of um, of, the, uh, of a tracing uh, 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 an application of metal tracing uh, that I did during my PhD about the iron production in southern France during the second and the first century BC. Because in this region at that time, uh, this territory was divided into two. Uh, uh, yeah, two territories. So first, uh, so at the south, the Roman were already occupying the province of the Transalpine, with the well-known uh, city of Narbo Martius. And in the same time, in the northern part of this region, uh, different Gallic tribes were occupying the territory with uh, two cities already existing in Tolosa and Segedon. So uh, an important uh, finding in the 90s wa uh, was uh, a lot of iron bars uh, offshore the city of Les Saintes Marie de la Mer here. And the question uh, uh, I tried to answer during my PhD is if those uh, findings, those bars, were related to an important iron production uh, uh, of, in Roman times in the district of the Montagne Noire here. And in the same time, so no, another important finding was uh, the finding of Gallic bars, uh, which are quite rare, in the two small villages of Montans and Rabastens here. And one of the questions I uh, addressed during my PhD was if uh, these uh, bars were related to uh, the metallurgical remains of the Gallic iron production in different sectors in the Tarn department. <clears throat> So first concerning the Roman iron bars from Les Saintes Marie de la Mer. So as I said, it was a very important finding in the 90s because it gave us a, a wide open window on the um, iron trade in the, in, the, in the Mediterranean Sea during the Roman times. So in this, in this uh, so offshore, this city of Les Saintes Marie de la Mer, almost 30 uh, shipwrecks have been found containing different objects. So lead, bronze, copper ingots, and huge quantities of uh, iron bars with sometimes uh, several tons per, uh, per shipwreck. So these bars have been studied uh, by, so by archeologists and they show that they have different shapes, different standardized shapes, depending on the purpose they've been produced for. They also could be stamped, uh, which have been uh, interpreted like the signature of the producer of this, uh, of this iron. So before my PhD, uh, some colleagues um, uh, used the technique of slag inclusion analysis on this subject to, uh, to explore their provenance. So here are the results for the cesium to rubidium ratio. And as you can see, we can sort the samples into different groups. So we have a first group with the stamped bars here in green and in pink, and also some unstamped bars which, uh, which correspond to the composition of the Montagne Noire uh, remains in, in pink here. And on the other hand, we have uh, other bars with a distinct uh, elemental composition, which argue for another provenance for these bars. 
So I analyzed the uh, ironized top composition of the same bars that I compare with that of, uh, of uh, uh, iron ores from uh, the Montagne Noir district. So you can see that, so first every bar have a very uh, homogeneous uh, ironized top composition, which is necessary to uh, use this technique uh, to trace ancient iron. And you can see that all the bars from uh, group one, uh, the stamped bars and unstamped bars, have a composition which is similar to that of the Montagne Noir. So it uh, also suggests and it validates, tends to validate a problem from the from this district for those bars. And on the other on the other side, we have uh, the bars from group two. Uh, so some of them have a composition which is distinct from the Montagne Noir, uh, while others have a composition which is uh, similar to the Montagne Noir. And maybe we have here. Again, the problem of overlapping composition between, between different uh, sources. Because the strict uh, stringing point here is, the, is that the very constant uh, thesium to rubidium ratio, and it is the same for other couples of, uh, couple of uh, uh, elements, uh, the, this very constant ratio argue for uh, a single source for those bars. And uh, the different iron stop composition can argue for uh, different uh, sources for these bars. But if we compare with uh, different data from the literature, it seems that the, the, the heterogeneity in the elemental composition and uh, a very narrow range of isotopic composition is something which characterized a specific type of uh, iron ores which uh, derive from hydrothermal veins so we call this or a gossant, and they develop during the, the, the chemical weathering on the surface of the mineralized, uh, mineralized veins. And on the other hand, the very constant trace element uh, ratio here and wide um, isotopic range is something which is specific to uh, different types of sedimentary iron ores. So here we suggest that even if we don't know the source so far of the bars from group two, we suggest that they come from a, sed a sedimentary iron source. So this is an example of how we can combine different tracer to uh, provide information on the, on the nature of the source we are looking for. So now for the Gallic bars on the, on the northern part of, uh, of, the, of the southern France, um, so these Gallic bars are very rare. So they are a specific type of currency bars. Uh, the only example found in the in the in the thousand half of, of, of gold, and they are unique by their size, which is twice longer uh, twice longer than uh, other example of these uh, currency bars. So of course, uh, on this bar we cannot apply the technique of slag inclusion analysis. That's why we use the technique of um, ironized top. So here I compare the composition of uh, remains from different sectors in the town department. So of course you can see that there is uh, again uh, quite a wide overlapping between this, uh, the signature of these sectors. But if we compare the, with the composition of, uh, of the Gallic bars, which is very homogeneous, we can see that they correspond, they seem to correspond to the mean value of the ambulance sector. So I, I, I cannot uh, uh, suggest I mean, it's, it's, it's an argument, but I cannot tell uh, that uh, these bars come specifically from this sector. But at least we can uh, propose, we can suggest uh, a local origin for these bars. But the most interesting result here is that if we compare those garlic bars with the Roman iron production, a simple t-test show that they are st statistically very distinct. So here it's an example of how we can use ironized top to uh, make the distinction between two sources of iron and two production of iron in a very narrow um, uh, scale, uh, I mean, uh, geogra geographical and chronological scale. Because in the southern part of this territory, we have a Roman iron production, which was intended for uh, the, 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 the trade, uh, the iron trade in the Roman world. And one of the hypotheses of uh, archaeologists working on those bars is that some of those bars were uh, destined for the, the, the Roman armies, which were fighting against uh, different uh, uh, German tribes in the northern Gaul. And on the, at the same time, we had uh, a, a Gallic iron production in the north. 
uh, in different sectors. And uh, this production was intended for a local consumption. And one of the hypotheses we'd like to, to test now, if we have access to uh, the, the collection, uh, some collection of, uh, of uh, iron products in Tolosa, is, is the final de destination of this iron production could have been this uh, city, which was quite important in the Gallic uh, times. So this is the first example of how we can uh, use different chemical tools to trace ancient iron in a specific context. So the second example I would like to, uh, to, to show you today is what I did during my uh, first postdoc um, uh, in the frame of the ERC project Silver and uh, my, my work specifically on the Iberian source of silver. Because since the Phoenician times and the Phoenician expansion uh, in the, during the first uh, million BC, uh, different sources have been uh, um, identified uh, in, in the whole uh, Mediterranean uh, Sea, with uh, Mediterranean region, sorry, with uh, some source in Anatolia, Greece, Sardinia, and a huge uh, resource of silver in, uh, in Spain. So after the, the, the Phoenician times and at the turn of the Second Punic War between the, between the Roman and the Carthaginians, the Romans conquered the, the, the Iberia. So they took the control of this, of this important silver supply, which transformed the uh, Roman economy and uh, led to, probably led to the Roman monetary reform in 211 BC with the appearance of uh, the denarius as the new, main, uh, the new uh, monetary standard. And that's a, a monetary system which uh, continue until the end of the Roman Empire. So in this context, I, would like, uh, I explore the question of uh, the, the a specific type of uh, silver ores, which is the galena. And uh, I question the common belief of uh, many archaeologists, uh, which suggest that the galena is the only source, was the only source of Roman silver. Um, so to explore, to answer the, the, the question and to see if we can have uh, other sources of silver in Spain, I analyzed the lead and silver uh, composition, the silver, lead and silver isotopic composition of galenas from uh, this country. And I compared the composition of these galenas with that of coins, which have been already uh, published in the literature. So you have here the uh, lead isotopic composition of Galinas from different regions compared with that of the coins. So what we can see first is that the lead isotopic composition of the coins mm, uh, fit very well with the composition of the Betic, uh, of the Galina from the Betic region in southeastern uh, Spain, with two sources here and here of, uh, of lead in that region and the composition of the coins which spread between these two sources. But now, if we compare the composition, the silver isotopic composition of the coins with that of the different galinas, we can see that uh, very few galina match the composition of the coins. So this first school uh, could, could be seen like contradictory results. But something interesting is uh, the relation between the silver isotopic composition of the galinas and the, the, their silver, silver content because we can sort uh, the galinas between two groups, the first group of rich galina, and we just have few examples of uh, those rich galina, probably because they've been used, widely used by the Romans. So these rich galina have very uh, a poorly fractionated uh, composition, which may reflect a source of, a mental source of silver for those, uh, the, 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 those galinas. And uh, it seems that their composition is uh, quite similar to that of the coins. Of course, if we would have more samples of this rich galena, maybe we could have uh, we, we had a, a, a better idea of the global, the total range of their composition here. And on the other hand, we have a silver pool galena, which are much more fractionated here, probably because of a crystal process. So what we suggest here, is that both of these uh, rich and poor galinas have been exploited, but in a different way. 
So the silver rich galena here, the, the, the red stars, uh, have been exploded like uh, they were a major, major source of the Roman silver. While the uh, poor galenas were also exploded, but only for lead. And this lead was then used as a silver extractor uh, to catch the silver from uh, alternate, alternative uh, silver ores which were depleted in lead. Uh, so some, uh, another study by Angulano in 2010 show, for example, that a lot of lead uh, have been uh, brought from uh, the Eastern Belize to the, uh, to the mine of Rio Tinto. And there were, this lead was used to extract the silver from a, a specific type of uh, uh, silver ores, which is jarosite, which is uh, rich in silver and depleted in lead. So this is uh, in this example um, uh, we can that's an example of the use of different uh, isotopic system to uh, gain information on the dynamics the, of the exploitation of uh, silver in in the in Spain during the Roman times. So a few remarks I would like to to say today is that of course all the different geochemical tracers have advantage and limitation which depend on the objects and on the uh, considered archaeological context. So some of them uh, will be very efficient in a specific context, and the same tracer will be uh, absolutely not um, uh, useful in another context. That's why. Uh, the, the the combination of different tracer could uh, be the, is the, the most promising approach to study the provenance of metals because as as we saw today it will bring new information on the nature of the source even if we don't know the specific source but just analyzing the objects could uh, provide information on the nature of their source and also uh, it could provide information on the dynamics of the uh, of the the, the, the metallic source exploitation in a specific context. Also, um, I would like to underline the crucial importance of the archaeological context, because in every provenance study, it makes no sense to uh, consider some sources which, uh, which were not exploited at the ancient times. And uh, obviously, the provenance hypothesis uh, should be tested on archaeological and historical indications. And that's the only way uh, combining geochemistry and archaeology, that's the, the only way we can study the problems of, um, of ancient metals. So I will be leaving the museum soon, and I would like uh, to show you, to explain you what is the next step for me. Because uh, um, so the next step will be a Marie Curie project uh, about the Viking oil production in Iceland, something I prepared with the Aarhus University and the Mosgard Museum, and I had the answer quite uh, recently that uh, this project has been uh, accepted. So um, why I am so interested about uh, Iron Viking? Maybe because they are very trendy, and there are a lot of TV shows now about Vikings. And um, there are a lot of stereotypes, uh, uh, so they can they are they are good looking, they are sympathetic people, but that's not the reason the reason of my interest uh, about the Viking iron. Because uh, beyond all the stereotypes we can have about the Viking, before being warriors, they were farmers, they were traders, and they produced a lot of iron in uh, the different uh, Norse territories. And they uh, moved, they transport this iron between the different uh, settlements uh, uh, all, um, in, the, in the northern part of Europe, but also across the, the Atlantic Ocean, because they were the first, as you know, to connect North America and Europe. So the current model of uh, the circulation and the production of iron in the North uh, society is that everything was produced in Scandinavia and transport into, transported into the different settlements. But, but this model is now uh, more and more challenged uh, by the, the growing number of archaeological evidence of an important iron production here in Iceland. So <clears throat> in this project, I would like to explore the, the, the hypothesis of uh, an important um, uh, trade of iron trade uh, by the Norse population from Iceland and in the in the other 
in the in those uh, iron settlement. And this study could bring new information on the ma migration patterns of the North population, and also on the the, the all um, um, uh, organization of uh, of the iron society. And because of the very specific geology of Iceland, uh, the, 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 this con the, the, yeah, this specific geology of Iceland offer us a very a wonderful tracer, which are the Stronson isotope composition. Because here with the, the small compilation of literature data, you can see that uh, the composition, the Stronson isotope composition of rocks from Iceland is very specific and very uh, different from the composition of other uh, Viking territory. So that will be uh, my work for the two coming years in, the, in Denmark. And before I finish, I would like to thank uh, my uh, PhD supervisors first, so Frank Patrasson and Sandrine Baron, and also my colleague Marie-Pierre Marie Pustur, which helped me a lot during my PhD and even after. I would like to thank also Francis Albaret and Yann Bichdotoft from the École Normale Supérieure de Lyon, which also have been very useful and I learned a lot with them. And also I would like to thank Lord Subieu, which is with us today, and uh, because without law, I wouldn't have been here today to present my work. And uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention today. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned the uh this is like in, in the in the first example that you gave you mentioned that that iron was possibly going to uh was on its way up to germany before and then it got it sunk or, or whatever so is that based on isotopic data from artifacts that they found in germany or uh no it, uh it is based on um on the some of the stems uh, of the of the of the on, on not on iron but on uh, lead ingots we show that there was transfer between uh, lead from the north going to the south and it seems that some um some bars some uh, similar bars by, by the shapes have been have been, have been found in the northern part uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, so at that place, in fact, uh, the, the the boats uh, which were um, uh, uh, sailing in the sea were stopped there, just in front of the entrance of the Rhone River, and they were waiting there to for the car the, their cargo to be transferred in smaller boats to um, to sail into the Rhone River. So during the different uh, storms, they, uh, they yeah, that's why there we have this concentration of boats here in the Saint Marie de I just uh, sorry, hogging the mic. Second question. Um, I was just curious because I mean, uh, with your with your research and all the things that have already been collected, like you could, you know, probably keep yourself busy your entire life just working with stuff that's already in collections. But knowing what you do about the movements of ore and metal objects, are there areas? Like, do you do field work? And is that is there like an area where you think there's high potential for finding materials like these sunken iron bars? Um. You. Uh, yeah. Just. To be sure to understand the question, if I'm doing field work and how, uh, yeah. Hard question, yeah. Okay, like so so the field the field work is not uh, is not my domain. I'm not an archaeologist, but of course, what I do is after the field work. I mean, we need to have a specific context, as I said, with uh, uh, um, I would say that so the archaeologists need to um, identify the potential potential sources because. If we just take into account all the potential uh, the, the sources in a specific area, uh, we can have a huge overlapping composition between the source. And there are a lot of archaeological examples which show that the ancient miners were selecting very specific types of uh, of uh, iron sources. So we need all this work to be done before we can do some uh, analysis. And also, I would say that uh, something which is missing in specifically for uh, iron is that we don't have a large, large uh, database with uh, the composition of different sources. And that's something I would like to uh, to begin with this uh, Marie Curie. And I will first focus on, of course, the northern part of Europe, 
where I think it's important now to have this approach and to create a database with elemental composition and also different isotopic tracers, which could be useful for, for yeah, distinguishing the different sources. So th th this is typically a, a huge uh, a huge work to do and uh, a work for life, so yeah. <laughs> Ishan, uh, so I, I was struck by the difference in the use of the iron between the Roman and the Gallic, even though the uh, source was very close to one another. Romans, there was a lot of it. They used it for a number of different types of uses. Mm -hmm. The Gallic seems to use it for currency, which would imply it was very rare. So I was wondering, is the difference due to technology within the society, the quantity of ore, or the quality of ore? Uh, I think it's most <laughs> a question for archaeologists, but I would try to answer. So um, I think uh, every time the Romans were exploring somewhere and they were just targeting some specific source, which were rich. So they probably stop exploring iron, iron in another place when they discover this, uh, this resource. So um, I think the geology is quite similar between the, the two, um, the, 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 two uh, the, the source in the, in the Tarn department and in the, in the, in the Montagne Noir. But I think it's just a question of the use of this, uh, of this, uh, of this iron and definitely a Probably the miners, the Gallic miners, had a different approach, and they were just exploiting uh, iron resource for uh, just a local, um, uh, uh, a local consumption. So yeah, I don't know if it will answer your question, but I think it's more a question of uh, the sociology of, the, of this of this population. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Hello. Yeah. One is. Um, about how how far does it change? So, how many kilometers do you have to have to to be able really to to find a, a change in the in the composition so that that you would be able how detailed your um, origin of the object can be? And the second one is: can you apply this technique to artifacts of wood or ceramics? Because it's clear, a uh, stable isotopes on, on metals, but in other objects of other sources. So uh, for the first question, uh, I would say it doesn't depend on uh, a geographical scale. It's more about the geology, because you can have very distinct formation and very distinct iron resource in the geological perspective, which are very close to each other. So, for example, in my PhD, another example uh, I worked on was uh, iron production in Togo. And we've seen that there were banded iron formation, which are sedimentary source, which were next to uh, some gossans like uh, uh, iron uh, concretion on the surface of the veins. And these two sources, which were very close, have totally distinct uh, trace element composition. Uh, so it's more a question of uh, the geology of the sources. And for uh, the second question, of course, uh, this kind of tracing approach could be very useful on different objects like uh, ceramics, uh, wood. I don't. I, I think that's not my domain, but I suppose there are some uh, some tests of uh, of a, a chemical or isotopic tracer to study the provenance of different materials. Yeah. Thank you, Jean, for this very interesting talk of very different metals. Right. And I have a question about silver. You had questions about <laughs> iron and uh, others. So uh, I would like to ask you about this uh, silver sources in Iberia, because you get a lot of reference data. What is the quality of this reference data? I mean, the, uh, I like. The, is there any traces of actually uh, silver mining in this area, or they are just alluvial deposits? What kind of uh, this reference data you have from this? Uh, from this very rich uh, region. Yeah, so uh, I would say that uh, this region are known uh, for all exploitation by the Phoenicians, Cart the Cartaginians, and later the Romans. But some of the data, and you write, to, I think it's a good question, because some of the data come from um, deposits which are modern. Uh, and we can have a variation between, uh, spe between specific deposits. Uh, I mean, between uh, ancient mines and modern mines. 
So that's maybe a weakness of this uh, global approach uh, with the compilation of data from all the literature, of course. But yeah, I would say that uh, for all these spaces, at least we're sure that some uh, mines are quite old. And the problem is that sometimes it could be difficult to see if it's a Carthaginian expo exploitation or a Roman one. That's maybe the weakness of this study, but uh, we need to have also this global approach and I show something about uh, Phoenician silver first, and that's the same. All the 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 the, the different composition come from also the literature concerning uh, geological source and not just uh, archaeological uh, silver silver source. Hi, um, my question is about uh, your sampling methods. I'm interested to hear more about the um, portable laser ablation technique that you developed and um, how it is less invasive on the object than the drilling. Okay, so yeah, I, I get for some of the... Oh, I don't have the picture, sorry, I don't have the picture of the of the laser system. Uh, but um, so this technique, as I said, had two main advantages. So first, uh, the, 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 the laser generator itself is very easy to transport different collections. And um, and main advantage for me is that um, we we can collect directly in the air on uh, big uh, archaeological objects. So the diameter is about, uh, I would say, uh, 100 uh, micrometers. That's something you can barely see at the, in the, with the naked eye. And um, uh, I have another presentation too. To tomorrow, I will talk about this uh, laser ablation uh, process. But I think it's a very promising approach, uh, yeah, for this reason. And um, uh, yeah, it was important to to see if the laser uh, itself, I mean, the, yeah, the, the laser beam could create a fractionation, uh, isotopic fractionation for different uh, isotopic system. And that's something I, uh, I I I checked during the the postdoc here in the film museum. So I would say that yeah, that's something that's a, a technique we can use uh, at least for some isotopes like. Uh, uh, iron, okay, I, I will just show you a small graph here. So here is the comparison between the first comparison and the blanks were not very clean. But at least you can see that all the, 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 the yeah, the, the, the good correspondence for almost all the, the samples I analyzed between the classical dr uh, drilling technique. Uh, uh, on, so those are different bars um, from my PhD. And the, the circles are the, 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 the portable, portable laser sampling on the same bars. So you can see that's working pretty well. So yeah, I would say that's an amazing technique that we can use here at the museum. And yeah, I think it's a very pro promising approach. Thank you. Okay, we do have a question in the chat. Are silver galena ore is the only identified source of silver in this part of the world at the time, or are there other examples for sources of silver outside of silver rich galenas? And are there galenas with silver targeted since the lead helps in the process of producing silver? For example, you can find silver with other metals such as copper. Um, so, yeah, I'm not an expert of uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the way to. Uh, uh, to, to separate silver from copper. I think it's also made with a different copulation process, like I showed. And uh, in this study, we, um, we, we've we seen, and there are many archaeological clues on that, uh, that the Romans were also exporting, as I said, uh, a gyrocyte, which is a weird, uh, I mean, the composition is quite uh, uh, weird, but uh, it's, um, it's a, a, second, a, a secondary uh, silver uh, silver source um, that developed by the weathering of primary, primary galenas. And uh, yeah, some other, so those uh, sources have been also exploited in the Roman times, not just galena. And uh, yeah, they could, be, they, they could have other elements with silver coming into this uh, alter, alteration um, uh, minerals and uh, yeah, I'm not an expert of uh, yeah, separation between uh, copper and silver, but they they were pro probably doing this very well. So, but you can also find uh, some 
uh, traces of copper in the in the in the coins, and uh, sometimes you have more copper than the than the than than the lead than the lead content in the coins. So this could also result from uh, you know the basement the basement process and the mixing of different metals, just to change the value of the coins. But this this it could also come from directly from the from the ore source. And we change, of course, the, also the color of the coins. So there were, um, uh, uh, let's say, they, they, they were, um, they knew how to do to change the color, and uh, yeah, they were very expert in, in metallurgy, of course. I don't think it's Could have probably just yelled, but uh, hi, Jean. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, super interesting and exciting to see what you've been doing for the past little while. Um, my question is about the laser ablation technique and um, issues of you're dealing with mainly uh, museum collections, right? But I'm assuming there are varying degrees of deterioration, corrosion, and then also maybe um, preservation techniques that different museums have used. So how, like, how do you deal are those not issues in your analysis, and how do you deal with those? So, um, so yeah, there is the, the problem. There is always the problem uh, of uh, the surface uh, oxidation, the surface corrosion. And uh, so, what I did is that before I turn on the pump, um, and I'm not focusing exactly the laser, so I have a larger beam, and I just uh, launch some laser pulses to remove all the corrosion part. And I have a small uh, camera on the screen to control the ablation. And I can see that uh, it will remove the, 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 the first layer, which is corroded. And then I'm doing the ablation. So that's something I try to develop. That's the kind of, um, that, that, this technique has been proposed quite recently. So it's still, I would say, a bit experimental. That's why it was important to, to optimize this process. But yeah, we have the problem. Uh, but it is the same with other um, uh, laser ablation methods, we have the problem of the corrosion that could change uh, the composition, I would say, at least for the stabilized stuff like uh, copper and uh, silver. I don't think, uh, yeah, I, I would be yeah, careful with that, but I don't think uh, the, the corrosion will change the, uh, the, the lead isotopic composition, but it is a problem for other isotopic systems. Yeah. So in obviously in comparison to like PXRF machines, it's a lot more um, accurate. But in uh, comparison to the larger, like LA ICBMS machine that we have here at the museum, is it comparable, or would you say that this is probably a better technique for these types of materials? So you have, you have two things. So first, uh, the main problem of the, the 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 normal laser device is that you need uh, to put the the object into the ablation cell, which is a bit like that. It's very small. So of course you cannot do laser, uh, I mean normal laser ablation uh, on big objects. So that's the that's why this technique is really useful. And I would say also that um, so um, it will also depend on uh, the the uh, the wavelengths of the of the laser beam is different from this technique and uh, the normal laser. So maybe that's something which could be in the future could be optimized on um, the portable laser. But with the, 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 the laser generator, we cannot uh, change the, 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 the wavelengths of, uh, the, of, of the portable laser. And maybe it's less efficient in, for the ablation process. And maybe it could also induce more fractionation, at least uh, I would say elemental fractionation. Uh, for example, you have all the volatilized elements which will be more uh, uh, collected than the non volatilized elements. So it's always a matter of um, what objects you're dealing with and what technique you, know, you can apply. So, of course, if you have small, um, uh, small, um, sorry, uh, small objects, uh, maybe it's easier to use the, the, the normal laser. But if you want to do isotopic analysis with a normal laser, you have to, uh, to link the laser device with the uh, multi collector mass spectrometer, which is also some uh, kind of uh, complicated uh, device. So, the last advantage of the portable laser is that you collect matter on a filter, and then you go into your lab and you do uh, all the, pro the normal process of wet chemistry uh, with these uh, these samples collected on the on the filter. 
So that makes things really easier for the, the analysis after uh, the, the sampling of the, of the metals. Yeah. Thank you. That's made work. We have time for one last question. Go on one. Go on twice. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. That was not too dense, like it's too 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 many information. Or I was afraid of that. But, um, yeah, I think it was pretty <laughs> I don't 